Act One of the Admirable Crichton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Admirable Crichton by J. M. Barry. Act One at Lome House, Mayfair. A moment before the curtain rises, the Honorable Ernest Woolley drives up to the door of Lome House in Mayfair. There is a happy smile on his pleasant, insignificant face, and this presumably means that he is thinking of himself. He is too busy over nothing, this man about town, to be always thinking of himself, but on the other hand he almost never thinks of any other person. Probably Ernest's great moment is when he wakes of a morning and realizes that he really is Ernest, for we all must wish to be that which is our ideal. We can conceive him springing out of bed light-heartedly and waiting for his man to do the rest. He is dressed in excellent taste, with just the little bit more which shows that he is not without a sense of humor. The dandiacal are often saved by carrying a smile at the whole thing in their spats, let us say. Ernest left Cambridge the other day, a member of the Athenaeum, which he would be sorry to have you confound with a club in London of the same name. He is a bachelor, but not of arts, no mean epigrammatist, as you shall see, and a favorite of the ladies. He is almost a celebrity in restaurants, where he dines frequently, returning to sup, and during this last year he has probably paid as much in them for the privilege of handing his hat to an attendant as the rent of a working man's flat. He complains brightly that he is hard up, and that if somebody or other at Westminster does not look out, the country will go to the dogs. He is no fool. He has the shrewdness to float with the current, because it is a labor-saving process. But he has sufficient pluck to fight, if fight he must, a brief contest, for he would soon be toppled over. He has a light nature, which would enable him to bob up cheerily in new conditions, and return unaltered to the old ones. His selfishness is his most endearing quality. If he has his way, he will spend his life like a cat in pushing his betters out of the soft places, and until he is old he will be fondled in the process. He gives his hat to one footman and his cane to another, and mounts the great staircase unassisted and undirected. As a nephew of the house he need show no credentials even to Crichton, who is guarding a door above. It would not be good taste to describe Crichton, who is only a servant. If to the scandal of all good houses he is to stand out as a figure in the play, he must do it on his own, as they say in the pantry and the boudoir. We are not going to help him. We have had misgivings ever since we found his name in the title, and we shall keep him out of his rights as long as we can." Even though we softened to him, he would not be a hero in these clothes of servitude. And he loves his clothes. How to get him out of them? It would require a cataclysm. To be an indoor servant at all is to Crichton a badge of honor. To be a butler at thirty is the realization of his proudest ambitions. He is devotedly attached to his master, who, in his opinion, has but one fault, he is not sufficiently contemptuous of his inferiors. We are immediately to be introduced to this solitary failing of a great English peer. This perfect butler, then, opens a door, and ushers Ernest into a certain room. At the same moment the curtain rises on this room, and the play begins. It is one of several reception rooms in Lome House, not the most magnificent, but quite the softest, and of a warm afternoon, all that those who are anybody crave for is the softest. The larger rooms are magnificent and bare, carpetless, so that it is an accomplishment to keep one's feet on them. They are sometimes lent for charitable purposes. They are also all in use on the night of a dinner party, when you may find yourself alone in one, having taken a wrong turning, or alone, save for two others who are within hailing distance. This room, however, is comparatively small and very soft. There are so many cushions in it that you wonder why, if you are an outsider and don't know, that it needs six cushions to make one fair head comfy. 
the couches themselves are cushions as large as beds, and there is an art of sinking into them, and of waiting to be helped out of them. There are several famous paintings on the walls, of which you may say, jolly thing that, without losing caste as knowing too much, and in cases there are glorious miniatures, but the daughters of the house cannot tell you of whom. There is a catalogue somewhere. There are a thousand or so of roses in basins, several library novels, and a row of weekly illustrated newspapers lying against each other like fallen soldiers. If any one disturbs this row, Crichton seems to know of it from afar, and appears noiselessly, and replaces the wanderer. One thing unexpected in such a room is a great array of tea-things. Ernest spots them with a twinkle, and has his epigram at once unsheathed. He dallies, however, before delivering the thrust. I perceive from the teacups, Crichton, that the great function is to take place here. With a respectful sigh. Yes, sir. Chuckling heartlessly. The servants' hall coming up to have tea in the drawing-room. With terrible sarcasm. No wonder you look happy, Crichton. Under the knife. No, sir. Do you know, Crichton, I think that with an effort you might look even happier. Crichton smiles wanly. You don't approve of his lordship's compelling his servants to be equals once a month. It is not for me, sir, to disapprove of his lordship's radical views. Uh, certainly not, and after all, it is only once a month that he is affable to you. On all other days of the month, sir, his lordship's treatment of us is everything that could be desired. This is the epigram. Teacups, life, Crichton, is like a cup of tea. The more heartily we drink, the sooner we reach the dregs. Obediently. Thank you, sir. Becoming confidential, as we do when we have need of an ally. Crichton, in case I should be asked to say a few words to the servants, I have strung together a little speech. His hand strays to his pocket. I was wondering where I should stand. He tries various places and postures, and comes to rest leaning over a high chair, whence, in dumb show, he addresses a gathering. Crichton, with the best intentions, gives him a footstool to stand on, and departs, happily unconscious that Ernest in some dudgeon has kicked the footstool across the room. Addressing an imaginary audience, and desirous of startling them at once, Suppose you were all little fishes at the bottom of the sea. He is not quite satisfied with his position, though sure that the fault must lie with the chair for being too high, not with him for being too short. Crichton's suggestion was not perhaps a bad one after all. He lifts the stool, but hastily conceals it behind him on the entrance of the ladies Catherine and Agatha, two daughters of the house. Catherine is twenty, and Agatha two years younger. They are very fashionable young women indeed, who might wake up for a dance, but they are very lazy, Catherine being two years lazier than Agatha. Uneasily jocular, because he is concealing the footstool. Uh, and how are my little friends today? Contriving to reach a settee. Don't be silly, Ernest. If you want to know how we are, we are dead. Even to think of entertaining the servants is so exhausting. Subsiding nearer the door. Besides which, we've had to decide what frocks to take with us on the yacht, and that is such a mental strain. You poor overworked things. Evidently Agatha is his favorite, for he helps her to put her feet on the settee, while Catherine has to dispose of her own feet. Rest your weary limbs. Perhaps in revenge. But why have you a footstool in your hand? Yes. Why? Brilliantly, but to be sure, he has had time to think it out. You see, as the servants are to be the guests, I must be the butler. I was practicing. This is a tray, observe. Holding the footstool as a tray, he minces across the room like an accomplished footman. The gods favor him, for just here Lady Mary enters, and he holds out the footstool to her. A tea, my lady? Lady Mary is a beautiful creature of twenty-two, and is of a natural hauteur which is at once the fury and the envy of her sisters. If she chooses, 
she can make you seem so insignificant that you feel you must be swept away with the crumb brush. She seldom chooses, because of the trouble of preening herself as she does it. She is usually content to show that you merely tire her eyes. She often seems to be about to go to sleep in the middle of a remark. There is quite a long and anxious pause, and then she continues, like a clock that hesitates, bored in the middle of its strike. Arching her brows. Oh, it is only you, Ernest. I thought there was someone here. And she also bestows herself on cushions. A little peaked and deserting the footstool. Had a very tiring day also, Mary. Yawning. Oh, oh, dreadfully. Been trying on engagement rings all the morning who is as fond of gossip as the oldest club member. What's that? To Agatha. Is it Brocklehurst? The energetic Agatha nods. You have given your warm young heart to Brocky. Lady Mary is impervious to his humour, but he continues bravely. I don't wish to fatigue you, Mary, by insisting on a verbal answer, but if without straining yourself you can signify yes or no, won't you make the effort? She indolently flashes a ring on her most important finger, and he starts back melodramatically. The ring! Then I am too late, too late! Fixing Lady Mary sternly, like a prosecuting counsel. May I ask, Mary, does Brocky know? Of course, it was that terrible mother of his who pulled this through. Mother does everything for Brocky. Still, in the eyes of the law you will not be her wife but his and therefore I hold that Brocky ought to be informed. Now. He discovers that their languorous eyes have closed. If you girls are shamming sleep in the expectation that I shall awaken you in the manner beloved of ladies, abandon all such hopes. Catherine and Agatha look up without speaking. Speaking without looking up. You impertinent boy. Eagerly plucking another epigram from his quiver. I knew that it was, though I don't know everything. Agatha, I'm not young enough to know everything. He looks hopefully from one to another, but though they try to grasp this, his brilliance baffles them. His secret admirer. Young enough. Encouragingly. Don't you see, I'm not young enough to know everything. I'm sure it's awfully clever, but it's so puzzling. Here Crichton ushers in an athletic, pleasant-faced young clergyman, Mr. Traherne, who greets the company. Ernest, say it to Mr. Traherne. Look here, Traherne. I'm not young enough to know everything. How do you mean, Ernest? A little nettled. I mean what I say. Say it again. Say it more slowly. I'm not young enough to know everything. I see. What you really mean, my boy, is that you are not old enough to know everything. No, I don't. I assure you that's it. Of course it is. Yes, Ernest, that's it. Ernest, in desperation, appeals to Crichton. I'm not young enough, Crichton, to know everything. It is an anxious moment, but a smile is at length extorted from Crichton as with a corkscrew. Thank you, sir. He goes. Relieved. Ah, if you had that fellow's head, Rehearne, you would find something better to do with it than play cricket. I hear you bowl with your head. With proper humility. I'm afraid cricket is all I'm good for, Ernest. Who thinks he has a heavenly nose. Indeed it isn't. You are sure to get on, Mr. Traherne. Thank you, Lady Catherine. But it was the bishop who told me so. He said a clergyman who breaks both ways is sure to get on in England. I'm jolly glad. The master of the house comes in, accompanied by Lord Brocklehurst. The Earl of Loam is a widower, a philanthropist, and a peer of advanced ideas. As a widower, he is at least able to interfere in the domestic concerns of his house, to rummage in the drawers, so to speak, for which he has felt an itching all his blameless life. His philanthropy has opened quite a number of other drawers to him, and his advanced ideas have blown out his figure. 
He takes in all the weightiest monthly reviews, and prefers those that are uncut, because he perhaps never looks better than when cutting them. But he does not read them, and save for the cutting, it would suit him as well merely to take in the covers. He writes letters to the papers, which are printed in a type to scale with himself, and he is very jealous of those other correspondents who get his type. Let laws and learning, art and commerce die, but leave the big type to an intellectual aristocracy. He is really the reformed House of Lords, which will come some day. Young Lord Brocklehurst is nothing save for his rank. You could pick him up by the handful any day in Piccadilly or Holborn, buying socks, or selling them. Expansively. You are here, Ernest. Feeling fit for the voyage, Traherne? Looking forward to it enormously. That's right. He chases his children about as if they were chickens. Now then, Mary, up and doing, up and doing. Time we had the servants in. They enjoy it so much. They hate it. Mary, to your duties. And he points severely to the tea table. Twinkling. Congratulations, Brocky. Who detests humor. Thanks. Mother pleased. With dignity. Mother is very pleased. That's good. Do you go on the yacht with us? Sorry, I can't. And look here, Ernest, I will not be called Brocky. Mother don't like it. She does not. He leaves Ernest, who forgives him, and begins to think about his speech. Crichton enters. Speaking as one man to another. We are quite ready, Crichton. Crichton is distressed. Sarcastically. How Crichton enjoys it. Frowning. He is the only one who doesn't, pitiful creature. Shuddering under his lord's displeasure. I can't help being conservative, my lord. Be a man, Crichton. You are the same flesh and blood as myself. In pain. Oh, my lord. Sharply. Show them in. And by the way, they were not all here last time. All, my lord, except the merest trifles. It must be every one. Lowering. And remember this, Crichton. For the time being, you are my equal. Testily. I shall soon show you whether you are not my equal. Do as you are told. Crichton departs to obey, and his lordship is now a general. He has no pity for his daughters, and uses a terrible threat. And girls, remember, no condescension. The first who condescends recites. This sends them scurrying to their labours. By the way, Brocklehurst, can you do anything? How do you mean? Can you do anything? With a penny or a handkerchief? Make them disappear, for instance. Good heavens, no! It's a pity. Everyone in our position ought to be able to do something. Ernest, I shall probably ask you to say a few words, something bright and sparkling. But, my dear uncle, I have prepared nothing. Anything impromptu will do. Oh, well, if anything strikes me on the spur of the moment. He unostentatiously gets the footstool into position behind the chair. Crichton reappears to announce the guests, of whom the first is the housekeeper. Reluctantly. Mrs. Perkins. Shaking hands. Very delighted, Mrs. Perkins. Mary, our friend, Mrs. Perkins. How do you do, Mrs. Perkins? Won't you sit here? Threateningly. Agatha. Hastily. How do you do? Won't you sit down? Introducing. Lord Brocklehurst, my valued friend, Mrs. Perkins. Lord Brocklehurst bows and escapes. He has to fall back on Ernest. For heaven's sake, Ernest, don't leave me for a moment. This sort of thing is utterly opposed to all my principles. Airily. You stick to me, Brocky, and I'll pull you through. Monsieur Fleury. The chef. Shaking hands with the chef. Very charmed to see you, Monsieur Fleury. Uh, thank you very much. Fleury bows to Agatha, who is not effusive. Warningly. Agatha. Recitation. 
She tosses her head, but immediately finds a seat and tea for Monsieur Fleury. Traherne and Ernest move about, making themselves amiable. Lady Mary is presiding at the tea tray. Mr. Rolleston. Shaking hands with his valet. How do you do, Rolleston? Catherine looks after the wants of Rolleston. Mr. Thompson. Thompson, the coachman, is received with honours, from which he shrinks. Miss Fisher. This superb creature is no less than Lady Mary's maid, and even Lord Loam is a little nervous. This is a pleasure, Miss Fisher. Unabashed. If I might venture, Miss Fisher. And he takes her unto himself. Miss Simmons. To Catherine's maid. You are always welcome, Miss Simmons. Perhaps to kindle jealousy in Miss Fisher. At last we meet. Won't you sit down? Mademoiselle Jeanne. Charmed to see you, Mademoiselle Jeanne. A place is found for Agatha's maid, and the scene is now an animated one. But still our host thinks his girls are not sufficiently sociable. He frowns on Lady Mary. In alarm. Uh, Mr. Traherne, this is Fisher, my maid. Sharply. Your what, Mary? My friend. Thomas. How do you do, Thomas? The first footman gives him a reluctant hand. John. How do you do, John? Ernest signs to Lord Brocklehurst, who hastens to him. Introducing. Brocklehurst, this is John. I think you have already met on the doorstep. Jean. She comes, wrapping her hands miserably in her apron. Doggedly. Give me your hand, Jane. Gladys. How do you do, Gladys? You know my uncle? Your hand, Gladys. He bestows her on Agatha. Tweeny. She is a very humble and frightened kitchen maid, of whom we are to see more. So happy to see you. John, I saw you talking to Lord Brocklehurst just now. Introduce me. At the same moment to Ernest. That's an uncommon pretty girl. If I must feed one of them, Ernest, that's the one. But Ernest tries to part him and Fisher as they are about to shake hands. No, you don't. It won't do, Brocky. To Miss Fisher. You are too pretty, my dear. Mother wouldn't like it. Discovering Tweeny. Here's something safer. Charming girl, Brocky, dying to know you. Let me introduce you. Tweeny, Lord Brocklehurst. Lord Brocklehurst, Tweeny. Brocklehurst accepts his fate, but he still has an eye for Fisher, and something may come of this. Severely. They are not all here, Crichton. With a sigh. Odds and ends. A stable boy and a page are shown in, and for a moment no daughter of the house advances to them. With a roving eye on his children. Which is to recite? The last of the company are, so to say, embraced. To Tom set as they partake of tea together. And how are all at home? Farish, my lord, if tis the horses you are inquiring for. No, no, the family. How's the baby? Blooming, your lordship. A very fine boy. I remember saying so when I saw him. Nice little fellow. Not quite knowing whether to let it pass. Beg pardon, my lord, it's a girl. A girl. Aha! Ha-ha! <laughs> exactly what I said. I distinctly remember saying, if it's spared, it will be a girl. Crichton now comes down. Very delighted to see you, Crichton. Crichton has to shake hands. Mary, you know Mr. Crichton? He wanders off in search of other prey. Milk and sugar, Crichton? A machine to be seen talking to you, my lady. To such a perfect servant as you, all this must be most distasteful. Crichton is too respectful to answer. Oh, please do speak, or I shall have to recite. You do hate it, don't you? It pains me, your ladyship. It disturbs the etiquette of the servants' hall. 
after last month's meeting the page-boy in a burst of equality called me crichton he was dismissed i wonder i really do how you can remain with us i should have felt compelled to give notice my lady if the master had not had a seat in the upper house i cling to that do go on speaking tell me what did mr ernest mean by saying he was not young enough to know everything i have no idea my lady but you laughed my lady he is the second son of a peer very proper sentiments you are a good soul crichton desperately to tweeny and now tell me have you been to the opera what sort of weather have you been having in the kitchen tweeny gurgles uh. for heaven's sake woman be articulate still talking to lady mary no my lady his lordship may compel us to be equal upstairs but there will never be equality in the servants hall overhearing this what's that no equality can't you see crichton that our divisions into class are artificial that if we were to return to nature which is the aspiration of my life all would be equal if i may make so bold as to contradict your lordship with an effort go on the divisions into classes my lord are not artificial they are the natural outcome of a civilized society to lady mary there must always be a master and servants in all civilized communities my lady for it is natural and whatever is natural is right wincing it is very unnatural for me to stand here and allow you to talk such nonsense eagerly yes my lord it is that is what i have been striving to point out to your lordship to catherine what is the matter with fisher she is looking daggers the tedious creature some question of etiquette i suppose she sails across to fisher how are you fisher with a toss of her head i am nothing my lady i am nothing at all oh dear who says so affronted his lordship has asked that kitchen wench to have a second cup of tea but why not if it pleases his lordship to offer it to her before offering it to me so that is it do you want another cup of tea fisher no my lady but my position i should have been asked first oh dear all this has taken some time and by now the feeble appetites of the uncomfortable guests have been satiated but they know there is still another ordeal to face his lordship's monthly speech every one awaits it with misgiving the servants lest they should applaud as last time in the wrong place and the daughters because he may be personal about them as the time before ernest is annoyed that there should be this speech at all when there is a much better one coming and brocklehurst foresees the degradation of the peerage all are thinking of themselves alone save crichton who knows his master's weakness and fears he may stick in the middle lord loam however advances cheerfully to his doom he sees ernest's stool and artfully stands on it to his nephew's natural indignation the three ladies knit their lips the servants look down their noses and the address begins my friends i'm glad to see you all looking so happy it used to be predicated by the scoffer that these meetings would prove distasteful to you are they distasteful i hear you laughing at the question he has not heard them but he hears them now the watchful crichton giving them a lead <laughs> <laughs> no harm in saying that among us to-day is one who was formerly hostile to the movement but who to-day has been won over i refer to lord brocklehurst who i am sure will presently say to me that if the charming lady now by his side has derived as much pleasure from his company as he has derived from hers he will be more than satisfied i'll look at tweeny who trembles for the time being the artificial and unnatural i say unnatural glaring at crichton who bows slightly barriers of society are swept away would that they could be swept away forever the page-boy cheers yeah 
and has the one moment of prominence in his life. He grows up, marries, and has children, but is never really heard of again. But that is entirely and utterly out of the question. And now, for a few months, we are to be separated. As you know, my daughters and Mr. Ernest and Mr. Treherne are to accompany me on my yacht, on a voyage to distant parts of the earth. In less than forty-eight hours we shall be under way. But for Crichton's eye, the reckless page-boy would repeat his success. Do not think our life on the yacht is to be one long, idle holiday. My views on the excessive luxury of the day are well known, and what I preach I am now resolved to practice. I have, therefore, decided that my daughters, instead of having one maid each as a present, shall on this voyage have but one maid between them. Three maids rise, also three mistresses. My lord! My mind is made up. I cordially agree. And now, my friends, I should like to think that there is some piece of advice I might give you, some thought, some, some noble saying over which you might ponder in my absence. In this connection, I remember a proverb which has had a great effect on my life. I first heard it many years ago. I have never forgotten it. It constantly cheers and guides me. That proverb is, that proverb was, the proverb I speak of. He grows pale and taps his forehead. Oh, dear, I believe he has forgotten it. Desperately. The proverb, that proverb to which I refer. Alas, it is gone. The distress is general. He has not even the sense to sit down. He gropes for the proverb in the air. They try applause, but it is no help. I have it now. Not he. With confidence. Crichton. He does not fail her. As quietly as if he were in galoshes, mind as well as feet, he dismisses the domestics. They go according to precedence as they entered, yet in a moment they are gone. Then he signs to Mr. Treherne, and they conduct Lord Loam with dignity from the room. His hands are still catching flies. He still mutters, The proverb, that proverb. But he continues, owing to Crichton's skilful treatment, to look every inch appear. The ladies have now an opportunity to air their indignation. One maid among three grown women. Mary, I think I'd better go. That dreadful kitchen maid. Oh, I can't blame you, George. He salutes her. Your father's views are shocking to me, and I'm glad I'm not to be one of the party on the yacht. My respect for myself, Mary, my natural anxiety as to what mother will say. I shall see you, darling, before you sail. He bows to the others and goes. A selfish brute, only thinking of himself. What about my speech? One maid among three of us. What's to be done? Pooh, you must do for yourselves, that's all. Do for ourselves? How can we know where our things are kept? Are you aware that dresses button up the back? Well, how are we to get into our shoes and be prepared for the carriage? Who is to put us to bed? And who is to get us up? And how shall we ever know it's morning if there was no one to pull up the blinds? Crichton crosses on his way out. How is his lordship now? A little easier, sir. Crichton, send Fisher to me. He goes. I have no pity for you girls. I— Ernest, go away, and don't insult the broken-hearted. And uncommon glad I am to go. Ta-ta, all of you. He asked me to say a few words. I came here to say a few words, and I'm not at all sure that I couldn't bring an action against him. He departs, feeling that he has left a dart behind him. The girls are alone with their tragic thoughts. Becomes a mother to the younger ones at last. My poor sisters, come here. They go to her doubtfully. We must make this draw us closer together. I shall do my best to help you in every way. Just now I cannot think of myself at all. But how unlike you, Mary! It is my duty to protect my sisters. I never knew her to be so sweet before, Agatha. Cautiously. 
What do you propose to do, Mary? I propose, when we are on the yacht, to lend Fisher to you when I don't need her myself. Fisher? Who has the most character of the three? Of course, as the eldest, I have decided that it is my maid we shall take with us. Speaking also for Agatha. Mary, you toad. Nothing on earth would induce Fisher to lift her hand for either me or Catherine. I was afraid of it, Agatha. That is why I am so sorry for you. The further exchange of pleasantries is interrupted by the arrival of Fisher. Fisher, you heard what his lordship said. Yes, my lady. Coldly, though the others would have tried blandishment. You have given me some satisfaction of late, Fisher, and to mark my approval, I have decided that you shall be the maid who accompanies us. Acidly. I thank you, my lady. That is all. You may go. Wrapping it out. If you please, my lady, I wish to give notice. Catherine and Agatha gleam, but Lady Mary is of sterner stuff. Taking up a book. Oh, certainly. You may go. But why, Fisher? I could not undertake, my lady, to wait upon three. We don't do it. In an indignant outburst to Lady Mary. Oh, my lady, to think that this affront— Looking up. I thought I told you to go, Fisher. Fisher stands for a moment irresolute, then goes. As soon as she has gone, Lady Mary puts down her book and weeps. <laughs> she is a pretty woman, but this is the only pretty thing we have seen her do yet. Succinctly. Serves you right. Crichton comes. It will be Simmons after all. Send Simmons to me. After hesitating, My lady, might I venture to speak? What is it? I happen to know, your ladyship, that Simmons desires to give notice for the same reason as Fisher. Oh. Triumphant. Then, Catherine, we take Jeanne. And Jean also, my lady. Lady Mary is reading, indifferent though the heavens fall, but her sisters are not ashamed to show their despair to Crichton. We can't blame them. Could any maid who respected herself be got to wait upon three? With languid interest. I suppose there are such persons, Crichton. Guardedly. I have heard, my lady, that there are such. A little desperate. Oh, Crichton, what's to be done? We sail in two days. Could one be discovered in the time? Frankly a supplicant. Surely you can think of some one. After hesitating. There is in this establishment, your ladyship, a young woman. Yes. A young woman on whom I have for some time cast an eye. Eagerly. Do you mean as a possible lady's maid? I had thought of her, my lady, in another connection. Ah? But I believe she is quite the young person you require. Perhaps if you could see her, my lady. I shall certainly see her. Bring her to me. He goes. You two needn't wait. Needn't we? We see your little game, Mary. We shall certainly remain and have our two-thirds of her. They sit there doggedly until Crichton returns with Tweeny, who looks scared. This, my lady, is the young person. Frankly. Oh, dear. It is evident that all three consider her quite unsuitable. Come here, girl. Don't be afraid. Tweeny looks imploringly at her idol. Her appearance, my lady, is homely, and her manners, as you may have observed, deplorable. But she has a heart of gold. What is your position downstairs? Bobbing. I'm a tweeny, your ladyship. A what? A tweeny. That is to say, my lady, she is not at present, strictly speaking, anything. A between maid. She helps the vegetable maid. It is she, my lady, who conveys the dishes from the one end of the kitchen table, where they are placed by the cook, 
to the other end where they enter into the charge of thomas and john i see and you and crichton are ah uh, keeping company crichton draws himself up aghast a butler don't keep company my lady indifferently does he not no your ladyship we butlers may he makes a gesture with his arms but we do not keep company i know what it is you are engaged tweeny looks longingly at crichton certainly not my lady the utmost i can say at present is that i have cast a favourable eye even this is much to tweeny as you choose but i am afraid crichton she will not suit us my lady beneath this simple exterior are concealed a very sweet nature and rare womanly gifts unfortunately that is not what we want and it is she my lady who dresses the hair of the ladies maids for our evening meals the ladies are interested at last she dresses fisher's hair yes my lady and I does them up when they goes to parties. Pained, but not scolding. Does. Do's. And it's me what alters your gowns to fit em. What alters? Which alters? Mary. I shall certainly have her. We shall certainly have her. Tweeny, we have decided to make a lady's maid of you. Oh, lords. We are doing this for you so that your position socially may be more nearly akin to that of Crichton. Gravely. It will undoubtedly increase the young person's chances. Then, if I get a good character for you from Mrs. Perkins, she will make the necessary arrangements. She resumes reading. Elated. My lady. By the way, I hope you are a good sailor. Startled. You don't mean, my lady, I'm to go on the ship. Certainly. But... To Crichton. You ain't going, sir. No. Firm at last. Then neither ain't I. You must. Leave him, not me. Girl, don't be silly. Crichton will be considered in your wages. I ain't going. I fear this, my lady. Nothing will budge me. Leave the room. Crichton shows Tweeny out with marked politeness. Crichton, I think you might have shown more displeasure with her. Contrite. I was touched, my lady. I see, my lady, that to part from her would be a wrench to me, though I could not well say so in her presence, not having yet decided how far I shall go with her. He is about to go when Lord Loam enters, fuming. The ingrate! The smug, the fop. What is it now, father? That man of mine, Rolleston, refuses to accompany us because you are to have but one maid. Hurrah! In better taste. Darling father, rather than you should lose Rolleston, we will consent to take all three of them. Phew! Nonsense. Crichton, find me a valet who can do without three maids. Yes, my lord. Troubled. In the time, the more suitable the party, my lord, the less willing will he be to come without the, the usual perquisites. Any one will do. Shocked. My lord. The ingrate. The puppy. Agatha has an idea and whispers to Lady Mary. I ask a favour of a servant? Never. Then I will. Crichton. Would it not be very distressing to you to let his lordship go, attended by a valet who might prove unworthy? It is only for three months. Don't you think that you, you yourself, you— As Crichton sees what she wants, he pulls himself up with noble, offended dignity, and she is appalled. I beg your pardon. He bows stiffly. To Crichton. But think of the joy to Tweeny. Crichton is moved, but he shakes his head. So much the cleverest. Crichton, do you think it's safe to let the master you love go so far away without you, while he has these dangerous views about equality? Crichton is profoundly stirred. After a struggle, he goes to his master, 
who has been pacing the room. My lord, I have found a man. Already? Who is he? Crichton presents himself with a gesture. Yourself? Father, how good of him. Pleased, but thinking it a small thing. Uncommon good. Thank you, Crichton. This helps me nicely out of a hole. And how it will annoy Rolleston. Come with me, and we shall tell him. Not that I think you have lowered yourself in any way. Come along. He goes, and Crichton is to follow him, but is stopped by Agatha impulsively offering him her hand. Who is much shaken. My lady, a valet's hand. I had no idea you would feel it so deeply. Why did you do it? Crichton is too respectful to reply. Regarding him. Crichton, I am curious. I insist upon an answer. My lady, I am the son of a butler and a lady's maid, perhaps the happiest of all combinations, and to me the most beautiful thing in the world is a haughty, aristocratic English house, with every one kept in his place. Though I were equal to your ladyship, where would the pleasure be to me? It would be counterbalanced by the pain of feeling that Thomas and John were equal to me. But father says if we are to return to nature... If we did, my lady, the first thing we should do would be to elect a head. Circumstances might alter cases. The same person might not be master. The same persons might not be servants. I can't say as to that, nor should we have the deciding of it. Nature would decide for us. You seem to have thought it all out carefully, Crichton. Yes, my lady. And you have done this for us, Crichton, because you thought that that father needed to be kept in his place? I should prefer you to say, my lady, that I have done it for the house. Thank you, Crichton. Mary, be nicer to him. But Lady Mary has begun to read again. If there was any way in which we could show our gratitude. If I might venture, my lady, would you kindly show it by becoming more like Lady Mary? That disdain is what we like from our superiors. Even so do we, the upper servants, disdain the lower servants, while they take it out of the odds and ends. He goes, and they bury themselves in cushions. Oh dear, what a tiring day. I feel dead. Tuck in your feet, you selfish thing. Lady Mary is lying reading on another couch. I wonder what he meant by circumstances might alter cases. Yawning. Oh, don't talk, Mary. I was nearly asleep. I wonder what he meant by the same person might not be master, and the same persons might not be servants. Do be quiet, Mary, and leave it to nature. He said nature would decide. I wonder but she does not wonder very much. She would wonder more if she knew what was coming. Her book slips unregarded to the floor. The ladies are at rest until it is time to dress. End of Act One